Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ninth uh, Eastern Himalayan Naturonomics Forum. This is the 9th of December, and we are on a panel for re the next gen technology for rewilding and monitoring natural assets. Uh, through this panel, we want to explore how um, different technologies can actually be used and deployed for rewilding with a special focus, especially on satellite mapping technology today. And today we are joined by three panelists who used technology ex extensively in their work, so in, in different ways to either drive conservation or sustainable agricultural practices. They are uh, Stephen Craigles, the manager of Vito's remote sensing unit since November 2014. Vito rem remote sensing develops and operates space and airborne based earth observation systems that translate raw data into consumable information about population growth, uh, urban development, agriculture and vegetation, natural disasters, and more. After receiving his master's degree in applied engineering uh, telecommun telecommunications, Stephen joined the Bell Labs of Lucent Technologies for research and development in optical networks. In 2001, he switched to the space industry and started working in Earth observation and satellite communication at Thales Alenia Space. Later, he moved on to NewTek, a leading Belgian satellite communication equipment provider, where he had different managerial roles in the R&D department until he became managing director of NewTek subsidiary in Berlin. Stephen likes to be at the sweet spot where cutting edge technology, creative people, and viable business meet. He firmly believes that technology can accelerate our transition to a sustainable world. Michael Anthony is a business development expert in emerging markets and was instrumental in kicking off the micro insurance business at Allianz that has grown into a portfolio of 40 million people insured in several markets in Africa and Asia. He has co founded Earth Analytics India to use satellite data for risk assessments of natural resources. The pursuit of developing a business model for the base of the economic period also drives Michael. He wants to de-risk the shift to regenerative agriculture through financial instruments. Previously, Michael had worked in the Allianz SC head office in, Mu in Munich, driving the company's climate change agenda, and as a spokesperson for the company to the media and public. Prior to joining Allianz, Michael worked as a journalist for German media outlets such as Spiegel from Israel and the Palestinian territories, and he founded and led a Berlin-based institute that connects journalists. Dr. Bremley Lingdo is the founder and CEO of Worldview Impact Foundation and is a climate change and sustainable development professional with over 20 years of experience working with governments, IDOs, I NGOs and the private sector, developing a range of innovative projects in Asia, South Africa, and South America, aimed at producing ecologically sound and economically viable activities that contribute directly to reducing rural poverty and gener generating productive, sustainable livelihoods for vulnerable local communities. He now works extensively in the area of climate change adaptation through regenerating ecosystems and farmlands, especially in the Eastern Himalayan region, whether the mangroves of Myanmar or farmlands and degraded forests in Meghalaya. Through his involvement with initiatives like Earthbank, Remy is exploring the different ways in which new technology, from drones to blockchain, can be used to transform lives, livelihoods, and lands in the region. His previous assignments include working with the United Nations and the World Bank in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So with those introductions, I would like to uh, actually start with something a little softer, just to introduce the context of technology in conservation. And with that, I would like to, um, I would like to direct my first question to uh, Bremley. Uh, Bremley, you've been working with technology from a practitioner's point of view, applying it to on-the-ground ecosystem restoration and conservation across a range of different technologies. What is the biggest, biggest technical or technological challenge you face in harnessing technology to preserve and restore ecosystems based on your field challenges and the needs you have as, as a practitioner? 
Great, let me give you a direct case study of our work in the Arawadi Delta of Myanmar. So that part of the world was hit by a massive cyclone in 2008, Cyclone Nargis, that uh, knocked down all communications lines and infrastructure in the coast. Almost 250,000 people died, and it was also still under the control of the brutal military regime then. So aid agencies were not allowed into the affected areas, hence much more lives were lost. So it's the highest risk uh, on the climate radar also, that particular area. So when uh, the government opened their doors in 2012, the military government then, we decided to engage with the two marine science universities to help train the young people and restore their mangrove ecosystems in order to create a natural barrier and a shield. So fast forward to 2021, from 2012, we have more than 20 million trees on the ground. Now, going back to 2017, I had applied for this uh, Bridge Builder Challenge, which is a challenge called by the Pope in Rome, who was the patron of this challenge. It's a million dollar pot of money, and there were 750 projects that pitched from around the world. Uh, luckily, we were in the top five, and we roped in together our colleagues uh, from Oxford, a drone company called uh, Biocarbon Engineering. And then they were tasked with deploying their tree planting drones that can fire 100,000 tree pods a day in a swamp, but also use 3D mapping, high resolution scan of the entire coastline where we are doing our large scale mangrove restoration. It was a very much of a hands-on, uh, uh, you know, people-led design, design thinking project. So when we actually got to Myanmar and asked the women and the men of what their needs were, they said, we actually don't have any map. So can you reallocate your budget from actually tree planting using machines, which we can do by hand, to actually mapping much more of the area where we can plan much more if, even when you're gone? So those were the technical things we thought, well, we will test tree planting and do a lot, but actually we had to redesign and repackage our budget for helping communities map the entire coastline of the, of, of the project area because the government or the Ministry of Environment had nothing. The actual marine science department of these two universities were just marine science in name. They didn't even have a test tube in their lab. So how will you even expect them to restore mangroves when they were totally ill-equipped? So we di directed all the budget into training local pilots and mapping with three-dimensional scans so we can create maps for the community which were then used by the VCS standard to generate the first ever blue carbon credits under the VCS protocol in 2018 using the maps, high resolution scanners, uh, 3D maps that we use using both the drones and the satellites. So this was quite amazing for a country that had nothing and building up from scratch. And then we also had to work with the government to transfer the, the land management to the community. So the carbon rights will also go to the community draft a new law uh, for the transfer of management of forests. And after that, we also had to draft a new law on the Ministry of Environment and Forest to protect the little baby mangrove trees that have planted so no one can touch them and make them like a protected zone, um, marine protected zone. And with these two laws um, incorporated into our, our project, we were able to get the VCS uh, blue carbon credits, VCUs, which were then selling at you know five to ten dollars, and now selling at thirty dollars per ton because it's the first one in Asia. So that was quite impressive. So I'm really grateful we were able to use the drone technology and high resolution mapping and 3D scanning uh, to help our communities map their ecosystems and train them on the ground to really work on large scale restoration of the ecosystems. That's it. Thanks, Brahmi. That's a fantastic case study. So we'll come back to you with further questions, but uh, now I'd like to direct a question to Stephen. Stephen, Vito has been working extensively on using remote sensing to map biodiversity and manage forests. What are some of the challenges you see in this area, and what are the opportunities for using technology to solve some of the key monitoring problems we face in conservation, uh, for example, like how Brahmi described? Yes, Joanna, thanks for having me on this panel. So indeed, FITO has been working for quite some time on a monitoring of vegetation. Actually, we started back in 98, where we had a spot vegetation initiative and where we only had um, pictures of one kilometer resolution. 
So um, that's a bit tough if you want to help uh, local people. But thanks to advances on Earth observation and on initiatives like, for instance, the Copernicus system of the European Commission, uh, more up-to-date and more detailed information is available. And we totally leverage on, on those initiatives to do more. Yeah? Uh, for instance, one of the things, and also recently the, the additions uh, that are possible and the analytics that are possible with machine learning techniques, deep learning uh, things, they help us a lot. So for instance, we have recently um, been working with IASA, Austrian uh, organization, to generate what we call Nature Map Earth. If you Google that uh, Nature Map Earth, you have the results of that project. And that's where we wanted to generate a, a map with uh, that classifies different prototypes or different forest types, like uh, undisturbed, replanted, woody, and all of that. Yeah? The challenges there to make such a thing is that you need to have high quality and sufficient local data and training samples. So we for sure could leverage on things that uh, the team of Brimley was doing that have very detailed high level uh, local information and combine that with more rough uh, satellite information. Um, what we also see is that apart from this local information, you need to have sufficient spectral information not all satellite missions have the right set of bands uh, available for a uh, thorough analysis. So, for instance, if we look even at a, a satellite that was designed for vegetation, like the Sentinel-2 satellite of the Copernicus system, we quickly realized that we need, for instance, the capacity of a cloud penetration satellite like Sentinel-1 to really come up with up-to-date and accurate information. And so by combining, for instance, those Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1 image uh, the data, the, the SAR data, we can have a uh, measuring point, for instance, every week, even in cloudy information. And that's, for instance, some of the challenges that we explored during uh, the work that we recently have released, uh, the world cover map that we have done for the European Space Agency. So this map is uh, 10 meter resolution global information and it's freely available. So anybody interested there, just Google ESA world cover and you will stumble upon a worldwide map that has all information of the year 21 uh, at a global scale 10 meter resolution. I think 15 classes or something. Yeah? So feel free to browse around that. But of course, these public uh, available data sets have also their limitation. And that's why we often also combine it with uh, commercial initiatives like information from the bigger providers of satellite data being Planet or Maxar and so on and so on. There we see that uh, there is also a lot of interesting information as far as resolution is concerned, but also from the spectral side, it's still uh, a challenge to have everything we want. So we're also looking forward there to technology evolutions in uh, the area of hyperspectral satellite missions or hyperspectral airborne missions that give us much more spectral information. And that for sure will be very interesting to do classification and to do uh, other types of uh, stuff. Yeah. And of course, uh, as also Bremley mentioned, LiDAR information coming from drone missions is also very important and can be combined. But that is actually also one of the challenges that we are facing, that is all those different uh, information sources are rather interesting, but it becomes a huge task to combine all that into one big piece of understandable information. Yeah? So although there is different layers and at different levels and different resolutions, a lot of information available, combining all that into something usable, in the field is often still a challenge. And that's why one of the things that we're working on is how can we standardize more so that the integration of different data sets is um, more easier. And one of the things that we have done over here in Europe is for instance, setting up a standard on uh, biodiversity monitoring. It's a project called Europabom. And there we're trying out if uh, some kind of standard would help us in achieving 
uh, uh, a quicker take up of all that information. So I think those are roughly the main challenges that we have faced, Joanna. Thanks a lot, Stephen. So coming to you, Michael. Uh, Michael, we've been working, you've been working with the Balipara Foundation for some time now to do a forensic assessment on the state of forests in the Northeast region. So what are some of the challenges you've faced while doing this mapping and what are the areas of opportunity that you see for further technological development? Thanks, uh, thanks, Joanna. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, yeah, we, we did some work um, in Assam um, and, and something that was of interest to the Balipara Foundation was to understand um, what, where are tea plantations and, and how do these tea plantations develop vis-a-vis -vis, um, other forestry areas. And then, of course, in a second step to also understand um, what is the evolution of tea plantations or are there tea plantations being set up um, at the expense um, of forest wildlife. And um, so, so we, we did a uh, probably a fairly straightforward classification um, of different forestry areas with a limited amount of uh, ground data points that, um, that we received. So it's, it's sort of a straightforward remote sensing work um, to apply some uh, um, machine learning based um, classification algorithms that of course have a bit of their downsides if, if the number, if, if the, the amount of ground data is limited, then, then um, uh, it has to be a good balance between what is machine learning and what is sort of a more knowledge based approach. Um, but still we were able to uh, uh, differentiate between um, uh, some plantations that we um, detected and um, over larger geography in the Tejpur district um, and forestry areas. Um, so, so it, it was a mix of something which is more an automated machine learning exercise and a more knowledge-based forensic exercise. And if you want to see sort of those, those two extremes, and I think this is probably in terms of where I see the, ro the role of remote sensing and also where I see further opportunities, it's, it's somewhere on that spectrum between more forensic and, and, and more and machine learning based because if I reflect on the challenges um, of this particular exercise but also of similar ones then I could probably give quite a similar um, tour d'horizon uh, uh, as, as, as Stephen um, was just saying because clearly what we came across as the first challenge for this exercise is the cloud coverage which of course in geographies of um, South Asia um, particularly then once we move into the mountainous region, is very prevalent. Um, so that leaves us with a limited choice in exploiting um, both spectral information, but also spatial information, um, in the sense that the optical satellites um, give us more bands with which we can work, operate, differentiate between um, different land classes. And it also the optical data gives us better spatial um, resolution, um, which in the forestry sense is probably not um, so important, um, but but our other area um, of interest, agriculture, of course, that's very important because uh, you have particularly in India very small field sizes, so spatial information is important. And then, of course, there's also the repeat frequency of the satellite. Um, so how often does a satellite come round? And, and there again in South Asia, it comes around slightly less frequent than in Europe. Um, so, so we generally have per satellite an interval of 12 days, so we also have to combine um, different satellites. Um, so that's, th this is another parameter which, um, which introduces a challenge. So in this particular case now, we, we would actually have to mainly operate with Sentinel-1 data, um, which is a radar um, satellite that has the ability to penetrate cloud cover, um, but, but has slightly less spectral features that, um, that we can play with because the SAR signal um, operates in a different way. Um, and another challenge is that um, uh, radar satellite data is very data intensive. So also, um, particularly if we wanted to, so the next step of this exercise um, in the Northeast would have been to look back in time um, to see when did these plantations, uh, when did they start? Um, so when was when was forest actually being cut to build those plantations? So we would have to go back a lot back in time, and then things become more data intensive. 
Um, and, and that sort of brings an probably an operational aspect. Now there are more and more tools um, available and platform available that automatically um, pre-process data. So particularly for Sentinel, the, the, the processing, um, processing data is a very heavy exercise. So that, that's something that can be increasingly dealt with. But, but generally, I think um, next to the multitude of variability of different data sources, they're also very heavy um, uh, to process. So that's probably another, um, another challenge to reflect on. Um, and, um, and, and I think something which, which maybe I can, I can come back to later also in an exercise is, is to find the right balance between um, understanding the signal and understanding the context. So that for us is, is probably the main theme and that also played out in this exercise in the Northeast. But I can leave it here for the moment. Thanks, Michael. So, Michael, um, just to, I think, come back to you again on the going a little bit more in depth. So, you've been doing a lot of work through Earth Analytics across India. And with your work, is there a specific case you'd like to highlight to kind of delve a little bit more deeply into what you've been talking about? Sure. I mean, I, I think one case uh, which is currently um, on our desk as part of a larger exercise is. Um, uh, it's called Soilify, um, is, is the activity name, is to understand um, and monitor regenerative agricultural practices. Um, because we see, um, well, first we see a heightened interest by, um, let's say, part of the farming community, um, but also part of international organizations or go government initiatives. And, and the fo our focus is very much um, India for that matter, um, to stop the degradation of soils because the, the degradation of soils is, is um, for large parts of India, um, extremely risky from a food security perspective. Um, but of course, also, if we look at the practices um, that are being applied um, in agriculture in India, then the, the stubble burning, for example, which is well known across the Northern states in India, they lead to very heavy smog and pollution in, in, in Delhi, which makes sort of Delhi one of the most polluted cities worldwide. So that the practices the, if you like, the non-regenerative practices not only have an impact on the health of the soil in the long run and hence the yields, but they also have an immediate impact on the lives and the health of, uh, um, of the population that live in those geographies or neighboring geographies and cities. Um, so hence there's a push to stop soil degradation. Now, if that is to be turned um, in, in, a, in a positive manner, then there's of course also scope to generate carbon um, certificates. Um, and there would also be investment cases into, you know, coming out of the co conservation finance space. So this is an area which is, um, which can also affect agroforestry, but, but it's, it's of course now currently we're more looking into the plains and I'll come to another more forest related um, project in a minute, but I'm just mentioning this because um, here again, we look into the multitude of satellite data that is available and approaches that are available. Um, and, and probably one, um, class of satellite data that we put our a lot of hopes in is the hyperspectral satellite missions that we're going to see um, probably a few more coming up um, also by the Indian Space Agency has one in the pipeline um, the Italian Space Agency has one system up and the Germans are also um, planning to launch one um, next next year and, and a lot of that will be uh, free of charge it will come at a good resolution a good spatial resolution so it will give us a lot more information um, to play with, to understand um, composition of, of soil, a composition of plantations, type of plantations, type of forests, etc. Um, which so far the industry, the remote sensing industry, has worked with a bit in the past in some of earlier data sets, but, but I think that, that brings a lot of scope. So that's one, one thought I think that is important. And another th thought, I, I can maybe just, just to show it, um, is, is, I mean, just as a, to illustrate the thought that I have, okay, forest capital, we might get back to carbon stock estimations, but I just wanna share this one. It's, it's, it's actually a very simple thing what we're doing here, but it, it's more about the approach than the data that we use because the data is really plain simple. Um, but, but the approach that we have here is, is um, we, we took some effort around um, deforestation. This is in the Jharkhand region. Um, in uh, Jharkhand state in India, um, Kodarma districts, um, which also has a lot of a lot of forest, and we see a lot of illegal uh, mining activity going on there. 
And, um, and in this particular case, the um, commodity that is being mined is mica. Um, and mica is being used in cosmetics and then coloring of cars and, and other things. And it's being sourced majoritively from that district in India. Now, um, so what, what we did from a technology point of view, what we did was, uh, I guess, two things. One, one was we used a sort of an optical index just to uh, kind of get a map of where mica is being mined as a, sorry, where mica is being found as a mineral. Um, so that there are some algorithms which can be applied from, from Landsat data and also to an extent from Sentinel. Um, so, so that you to basically do, do, a, do a general mapping exercise. And then we turned to um, high resolution optical data, which for some geographies there was actually available um, even on Google Earth. So it's, it's, it's plain and basically for everyone to do. Uh, it's not really high tech. Um, but in that alone as a tool actually helps us to, you know, if we zoom in, it's, it's quite obvious that the mining area increases. Um, so it's a kind of um, almost, um, it's a purely visual and optical um, investigation, but we're more concerned about sort of that, that approach. So, so, so that, we, that we take, we, we apply forensic tactics almost to understand um, what is the degree of, of deforestation? And we'll also always have to find a lot of local guidance um, to understand the context. So this is actually an example where understanding of context almost beats remote sensing, um, because this is something you can visually um, interpret, but you need to understand the context very well. Um, and you need to speak to different organizations on the ground. So in this case, um, we, we spoke to some NGOs that are um, you know, helping to protect children's rights. Um, there's also one, you know, trade union for the miners. So they give us context and they tell us, you know, oh, you know, when we had the COVID, um, you know, the schools were shut. So all the students went back to the mines. So there was an increase in activity. Um, so that helps us to understand the ecosystem. And our approach is, is um, balancing the remote sensing techniques, which can be sometimes very sophisticated, hyperspectral, and sometimes very easy, such as this one. But balance it with the um, with the ground information, um, so that we that we understand the context better. So this is one thing, uh, one thought I want to um, I want to highlight, which is not very technical. And the other one, which sort of goes along the same um, argument, is to see what we can do in a forensic manner, i.e., the local context. We can also do it in a more um, macro level way. So we can see, can we merge social economic information with sort of more remote sensing sourced land cover type of information. So here is an exercise we did um, last year to kind of forecast the changes in land cover in the state of Telangana um, in India. And we actually, according to that software slash input that we gave, um, was that that um, we, we were foreseeing a decrease in uh, forestry area by 12%. Now, that of course depends on the assumptions you take as with any modeling and the data you, you put in. Um, but um, so, so here it's, it's you know, mainly it's, it's infrastructure development, um, but you could put in different layers to give you an example. So you put in um, a layer of infrastructure development. So where do you see road activity progressing. Of course, if there are roads being built and also settlements will follow, then you need to make space. Um, you could put in a minerals map and then you could, you know, match the minerals map or commodity minerals map with what's the international demand for it. So now you have the green revolution, you have the e-mobility. So obviously there are a lot of such minerals that need to be mined. So you can match that one. Um, and then of course you can have um, income uh, level data. So putting in these different um, data sets and cross-checking it with land cover and also climatic data. So for the Northeast Assam, we looked into what are the forecasts of um, climate change, um, which would affect plantations, tea plantations. So that will have an impact. Um, so, so I think that the level of sophistication you can obviously, you know, is, is, is eternal. So you can make this, of course, way more sophisticated to, to understand uh, what uh, or, or use remote sensing a bit also in a, in a predictive way, of course, with all caution you need to apply, but, you know, try to be also use it in, in anticipating changes. And, the, and, and you could then, for example, not something we did, but you could work on different scenarios. So you could, you know, by work on some scenarios, then put in different input factors into the model and then work out, 
you know, how, um, how land cover, or in this case, forestry areas would be impacted if you, if you assume certain scenarios. So that's the second example um, that I wanted to bring just to, again, emphasize the point of finding a good balance between contextual information and making use of latest technology in remote sensing to substantiate that um, contextual information. Thanks a lot, Michael, and thanks for a fascinating uh, case study on both uh, Dhakan and Telangana. I think we'll come back to the question of predictive uh, modeling in a bit. But uh, now, Stephen, uh, I want to actually ask you if, because Beatles also been doing a lot of uh, work on the ground, specifically in biodiversity mapping and in forest management specifically. So. Uh, what are the kind of cases you see emerging that are interesting from a technological point of view? Is there any specific case you want to highlight right now? Well, there are a couple of things that we, we have tried to uh, set uh, over here in Europe, where we're trying to set up a European way of uh, biodiversity monitoring. But there are clearly still some challenges ahead. Um, so, as, as identified uh, earlier, um, standardization is one of them, yeah? and that's what we have been investigating. So, let me see if I can share my screen a little bit on this, uh, on the, the examples. As you can see, biodiversity monitoring is, is, is rather complex, and there are uh, there's a mixture of, of policies and scenarios and modeling and uh, grant uh, truthing and, and everything. So biodiversity on its own is complex, and you need to really take it from, from a distance uh, to really understand what's going on and to try to do something. And this, for instance, is what we try to do with some help of the European Union on the Europa Bond uh, network where we combine primary observations that, of course, um, include remote sensing technologies, but as indicated by uh, Michael and by Brentley, you, of course, need to have people locally in the field that really can translate what, you guys, what we are seeing into local observations and into things that are really helping people on the ground. But also, that needs to be structured in a way that it can be easily exchanged and that not for every project that you try to set up, that you have to start from scratch with gathering local information. And um, all that, the combination of those primary observations, they, they um, translate into a set of data and data cubes that are uh, easily accessible, standardized, and already processed to some level. Yeah. And that, in the end, will translate into things that can be used. For instance, one of the things that we're also looking at is how can we, from a science point of view, look at things, but translate that into a language that politicians and decision makers understand. And that, additionally, is quite a challenge. For instance, in this system, we don't include politicians in our research. And that's one of the things that we're exploring. How can we have people that are finally using these data and doing this decision making? How can they be included in setting up such a uh, measuring system so that not only the content is right, but also the way that you want to uh, transfer or bring the message to a bigger public that not ne that doesn't necessarily have uh, like three degrees or in or three PhDs to understand the technology. Yeah. So, and that's one of the examples that we have done uh, recently. I invite you to Google a bit on the Europa BOM um, word and uh, you will have more information. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I think uh, coming to Bremley now, so Bremley, you've been working again, like on, you've been working on this from more a different perspective because we've been looking at this from very remote sensing 
from a remote sensing point of view, but you've been working both on the ground with remote sensing with a lot of different technologies. And there's been a lot of discussion lately about especially how blockchain can be used to increase transparency and enhancing account accountability and eliminating deforestation in supply chains or an effective carbon accounting. And that is part of what you've been doing with our bank. Uh, so based on your work with blockchain technology, how do you assess its potential for a region like the Eastern Himalayas? Thank you very much for your question. Indeed, uh, I'm more of a ground trooper, uh, you know, playing the role of Indiana Jones or Crocodile Dundee both. Why I mentioned drones is that, you know, they're not gonna take off the jobs of local people or communities there, but they will only enhance the speed of uh, restoring trees, but they have to assist women on the ground. Uh, we have to focus on livelihoods and not just use machines to take over jobs, especially for local communities. So that's why we want to work in harmony with machines and new tech to enhance the speed of restoration of ecosystems because uh, we've just got less than nine years left in this uh, UN decade for ecosystem restoration. So having said that, we were able to deploy those drones to help the local communities in Myanmar, more than 250 women and men on the ground. And now we've reached 20 million trees because of that applied technology and also sell those carbon at a very high price. And I think we, some companies are even buying at $60 per ton because there are very few projects that have blue carbon uh, credentials right now, which uh, also measures the uh, sustainable development goals because each mangrove tree costs $1 to plant, but it actually brings $100 of total economic benefits and ecosystem services per tree per year. $1 for $100 of return and investment a year is massive. So you imagine if we are planting uh, 2,500 trees per hectare, the value of that one hectare per year is $200,000 beyond carbon, uh, flood defense, storm defense, uh, fisheries uh, recharge of 50% higher, oxygen production, water vapor, um, flood water retention, blocking of uh, you know seawater uh, 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 penetration into paddy fields and many more services add-ons. So we need to work beyond carbon and apply nature-based solutions in our work. And that's why we've been testing um, uh, this technology from Earth Bank now in Megala in the highlands where we are mapping land uh, with uh, the Hill Farmers Union. Uh, while I was stuck there during the pandemic, I traveled with my team from the Hill Farmers Union to 300 villages, and we recruited 100,000 smallhold farmers from across Meghala and Northeast India, uh, ranging from one hectare each. So that means we have 100,000 hectares to map. And we're starting that with the government of Meghala to do land banking, to map streams, reservoirs, rivers, the entire basin that flows from Meghalaya down to Bangladesh and Assam uh, with the uh, Meghalaya Basin Development Authority. It is the largest spring map mapping exercise in Asia. So it's very important to map these springs and watershed because uh, coming from the rainiest place on earth, we get like a billion liters of water a year and that water just goes tumbling down. Uh, if there is no flood water retention and rainwater harvesting at the highlands, causing a lot of uh, topsoil runoff and uh, also defor uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, degradation and landslides and a big loss to the community. So Earthbank is now helping us and our farmers to do uh, uh, carbon calculations of all the trees we've planted in our agroforestry projects, in our... Um, large-scale uh, uh, sacred forests, mapping all our living root bridges with the community. And uh, I hope we will have a bigger collaboration next year as Megala turns 50 with my government in Megala and apply nature-based solutions and natural capital accounting in the state of Megala, which can then apply to the whole country, a legislated policy, because uh, my professor at Columbia says the way we measure GDP in the nation state based on exponential growth and extraction is all wrong and flawed. So if we can integrate national capital accounting in all the state GDPs and the GDP of, the, of, of India and create a nature-based solution or payment for ecosystems market within the country, it would be amazing. So states that have contaminated and polluted their rivers and ecosystems can pay states like in Northeast India where 
forest still 70% intact and keep their forest standing, uh, go be going beyond carbon. So lowland communities can pay highland communities for keeping their rivers and aquifers clean because they will be using that same water downstream, village to village. So we need to map, we are mapping every village right now and, and all the ecosystem services, their forests, their land, their water, their entire assets and apply nature-based solutions are using blockchain uh, with their land records and land tenure systems of all indigenous territories and also mapping indigenous cultures and traditions uh, into the blockchain so we can tell the story from space, from 200 miles in space down soil to space and back from space to soil to help regenerate a farming in this uh, fight against climate change because it's, uh, it's uh, pivotal to fight um, in the eastern Himalayas, which is a biodiversity hotspot of UNESCO, and bring back those trees that are on the red list of IUCN and help our indigenous communities protect ecosystems on the ground and pay them a fair price of carbon, the last mile of climate finance, because one little guy with an acre or a hectare can never join the carbon market. But if we can combine our 100,000 farmers with 100,000 hectares, now we're talking and even policymakers will have to listen because at the end of the day, those are votes and they count. So that's what we're doing. And we're also doing the same thing in the Sundarbans. We are helping uh, 25,000 farmers with micro lending uh, because the loans are very expensive in India. They can go up to 25%. We de-risk their loans from 25% to just 5% by them restoring mangrove ecosystems. They can get 5% loans. They can grow other trees on land. They can, we're working directly with MFIs in India that have licenses to give these loans. And when Earth Bank reaches 100,000 members, it will become the Green Revolut, the Green Digital Bank with a banking license across Europe with peer-to-peer -peer lending. So with my little bank account in, in Barclays, which yields no interest, I can put 200 pounds into Earth Bank and that gets loaned into India and I get a yearly return of five to 6% minimum. And this, can activate the entire youth around the world, the greater generations, hundreds of millions of youth with a hundred bucks each can put the money into the earth bank and this can finance millions of farmers around the world for regenerative farming who would borrow at a much higher yield. And now through peer-to-peer -peer lending with just any person in Europe or the US can help farmers rise and fight climate change bottom up. So this is happening on the ground. So I'm really excited to be able to be collaborating with Earth Bank. And uh, next week on the 9th of December, we will be presenting here at the LSE as part of a European Union project, Key Action 2, on um, you know, reshaping our future and fighting, fighting climate change and measuring impact with uh, impact investors from around the world to scale up operations to a billion trees a year globally. Thank you. Thanks, Brahmi, and thanks for actually raising the question of natural capital. I think that is a very, it's a growing space and it is something we have to consider when we actually uh, talk about global budgets. And that is something we are also exploring throughout the forum. And actually building on that, so Stephen, uh, Vito does work in the area of natural capital accounting using remote sensing technology. So what has your experience with this been? And do you see this becoming a means to actually being able to mainstream through full cost uh, natural capital accounting at country level, and perhaps even to actually guide national budgets and economic policies in the future? Yes. So that is um, an interesting and challenging question, Joanna, because you then would suppose that I somehow can uh, look into the brains of politicians and know what they're thinking. But so what we have seen is that we have done, there has been a huge effort on exploring uh, the technology and doing research on how this could be done. But we, we see that we are now in a phase where we need to gear up a little bit to translate all that academic research into really practical guidelines. And that's where we are in the midst of it. Um, what is positive um, from the European side is that, for instance, the European Commission has uh, indicated the Green Deal as one of the more important strategic uh, way forwards. And if you browse through that, you see all kinds of uh, hooks and bits and pieces where you can uh, count on technologies like natural capital accounting to indicate that further. 
Another positive sign that we see is that, for instance, the European Central Bank, uh, the president, Christine Lagarde, recently said that biodiversity will be one of the uh, things they will look at in uh, context of their investments. So that combines a political will and that also adds a financial indication that economic and financial stability cannot be achieved without having things like natural capital accounting monitoring our ecosystems. So that's, I think, one of an important change that in the recent years has come up, but there is still, as said, quite some work that needs to be done and to really make it uh, operational and to really make it, make it usable. Eh? So summarizing what we have seen so far is that a lot of the information is already available, but it's available for your own usage. There is no structural uh, setup in which this technology is used or has been uh, is part of an essential technology. Yeah, it's more today like a passive monitoring, and I can give you all the information I want, but it's up to you to decide whether you use it or not. So we need some changes around that so that it becomes a must-do type of thing, where, for instance, in the European Commission, uh, people are discussing on how. Uh, countries will be forced to report on their natural capital accounting in a structural way. And indeed, like uh, my fellow panelists have already mentioned, it would be a way to balance the GDP only uh, way of looking at things. And it will be hopefully a way where organizations, both public organizations and private organizations will take their decisions not only on economical parameters, but also will add environmental parameters and environmental <clears throat> information into the decision-making process. But it's still not there. So in Europe, we have high hopes that probably three years from now, this will be something where countries have to report at European level what uh, will be done. On international level, that is still a bit open. There are still, there are some actions uh, being taken at UN level, for instance, where there are experiments done um, in, for instance, something which is called the NCAVE projects, where five different countries around the globe are trying, really trying out this new setup, this new technology, this new accounting system, and trying to learn from that. But we really need to speed up the game there and, and translate, again, all that academic research into something usable in the field and uh, additionally uh, by the uh, decision makers. Yeah. So we're, I would say we're still laying the puzzle, but we need to speed up the puzzle layering uh, a little bit and really come with initiatives that are concrete and exceed the, the, the research and really try to put it in practice and put it in motion. Thanks, Stephen. I think uh, it's important, again, that we're touching on the urgency of all of this right now. And um, actually coming, I mean, speaking of the urgency, like, and the need for actually looking forward. So, uh, Michael, coming to you, uh, what is the potential for actually predictive technology in monitoring forests? And can we actually design systems to predict where forest loss may occur or is beginning to occur in the Northeast region, for example? Or do we need more intensive investment in technological capacity to build the systems to support this? Or for example, like Stephen said, do we just need to bring it out of academia and figure out how to make it, uh, how to actually create the, the practical application for this, uh, what do you think this could look like? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's of course a, a kind of a very futuristic and, and broad point that you bring up. Um, I mean, I, I think sort of predictive modeling is probably on the frontier um, of remote sensing technology innovation. Um, maybe unlike in, in, in weather modeling where sort of all that predictive capacity is, is well established. Uh, and the models are well established. I think in in remote sensing, um, so we're not trying to understand the atmospheres, we're trying to understand earth and nature, um, or sort of the things we see on the ground that are equally complex. Um, uh, and I think remote sensing is 
currently still very focused and probably rightly so to understand what is what do we see right now and how do we account for it so it also links to the point on the previous discussion on natural capital accounting where i think the technology is um is developing quite fast and probably has a lot of the answers that eventually policymakers are asking for. It might actually have the answers even before policymakers are asking for it, because um, um, I, I think a lot of these things we can already um, account for. And the carbon market developments in the carbon market help us because they give the most clear directives as to, you know what are protocols that are being accepted in order to turn this into a carbon credit. So this is actually um, probably almost a forerunner of, of natural capital accounting because anything that comes out of the carbon market has already a price tag attached to it and there are already money flows attached to it. So, um, so the protocols are already um, pronounced even though quite recently, but they're already being developed. Um, in, in a technocratic way. So it's coming down from a policy level already to an application level, to a price tag level, and hence remote sensing has a very clear standard that it can, or the remote sensing industry has a very clear standard and set of protocols that it can look to and attach itself to and, and derive <clears throat> um, and, and, and sort of respond with products to. Um, now, in, in, the, in the more predictive space, I think that um, there are some tools and mechanisms around. I refer to one, which is sort of the integration of socioeconomic data and remote sensing data, which can give us directions. Um, there's, of course, a lot of um, things happening in the sort of machine learning and remote sensing um, and driven algorithms. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, it, it has to probably... Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's coming from different ends. It's becoming from policy-driven and it's coming from a machine learning-driven end. And I think remote sensing probably for some time will be quite busy and occupied to digest all of the numbers of new, um, not only satellites, but also you know, spectral bands and, and, um, and ways to properly measure the status quo before it will then move on increasingly also to follow what the discipline in, in weather monitoring has done to also move into the forecasting space. Thanks a lot, Michael, for that answer, insightful answer. And I think now just to wrap up this session, so Bremley, I think we discussed a lot of aspects of the future policy needs for natural capital, the question of predictive mod modeling, but what are the future directions you, in which you think technology needs to go to meet the needs of ecosystem restoration in the Eastern Himalayas? And I'm looking at this, whether it's for monitoring or financing or monitoring the potential impacts of climate change on ecosystems. Tell us of what you think needs to actually happen right now. Well, to be very frank with you, I was at the COP26 in Glasgow, the UN negotiations, and there's been a lot of hoo-ha between developed and developing countries. You know, a commitment of $100 billion was made to transfer to help adaptation for developing countries and least developing countries and small island states back in Paris during the Paris Agreement. Nothing of that has actually trickled down to the actual guys on the ground that needed the most. So I think uh, there needs to be a lot of trust building for actual uh, implementation when these kind of funds reaches the countries and all those pledges made by different heads of states of governments and, and, and ministers, one after the other, making a lot of promises, but who's gonna monitor them? Who's gonna hold them accountable? Are legislators and policymakers who come to these climate circuses every year making a lot of hot air promises until and unless the young people are engaged on the ground with some kind of technology that we've trained them to actually measure what the people they've elected to speak on their behalf are doing for their future, it's not gonna work. So this is where technology kicks in, where every young people armed with data on a phone or some kind of app can go and actually measure and be like investigative journalists to see what's going on, whether the big oil are still drilling, whether it's still coal mining and stuff like that. And we can reward these young people like stringers around the world with little technology they have and of course protecting them to have real data because if we just depend on government stats they're all wrong some of them don't even exist 
So how can you even start a project when you don't have the right data, right? Even if you do nature-based solutions, if you don't have the right economic data to feed into your machine learning algorithms and AI, it's gonna be all wrong because the machine learning and the AI will be as good as the data we feed. So we need to generate this real time correct data from these young people with some kind of smartphone, wherever they are on the planet, activate them uh, as our sensors in the ground where they keep feeding us real time and they become part of the payment for ecosystem services reward because they, we can't expect them to work for free. They need to be protected. They need to be armed as real green warriors in the ground. and need to feed user-led content and data from the field, whether it's forest, whether it's ecosystem, whether it's water, whether it's violation of environmental rights and regulations, whether it's stealing of land from indigenous peoples, we arm them with that technology. Homegrown, whether it's drone pilots and so on, it's so expensive to find, to fly these expensive fly-by-night consultants from Europe or the United States to go check on our forest. Hey, we can train the local guys. They are smart as anyone in these ivory towers, like where I'm sitting right now on the LSE. We just need to download the LSE library and feed it to the guys in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Because we pay a lot of money studying in these Ivy League towers. But hey, if this knowledge doesn't trickle down to the farmers on the ground, it's useless having all these fancy degrees. It needs to benefit the real people on the ground. So this is a call to action to all the youth out there. If you have that knowledge, please share it with the people on the ground. Help make a difference because if we only have one planet and this is the time to engage. Do not just wait for politicians who make promises for you on your behalf. You need to take action no matter how small, no matter how remote you are, because collectively, if we can combine our resources and our energy and our passion, we can make a difference in this particular UN decade for ecosystem restoration to fight bottom up from the ground in our, a battle for the planet and help each other. So this is my advice to all the youth out there listening. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Bremley. And thanks a lot, Stephen and Michael for joining us today. Uh, I think we had a really great uh, conversation on, I think, the different aspects of technology and just monitoring ecosystems, managing ecosystems, actually looking at how we can uh, protect them better. And I would like to thank uh, GSTIC and Vivo with whom this panel is being hosted in partnership with. And thank you everyone for joining us again. Goodbye. Thank you, pleasure. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye guys. Take care, all the best. May Bye. the forest be with you always. Bye. Bye-bye.